All right, what's going on, SoFlo? How's everyone doing? My name is Jack, and I am the student director at a church right outside of Baltimore called Mosaic. Anyone here ever been to Baltimore before? Yeah, love it. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful, trust me. I, I shouldn't even bother. You guys are from Florida, you get it. It's not like that, but it's nice. I like it out there, all right? Uh, but I, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be in Florida with you guys. I've heard a lot about SoFlo. I've always wanted to see it, so I'm really honored uh, to be here. But I'm especially excited today because uh, you guys are in this series called, series called Psalms in the Summer, and I believe there are an infinite amount of things that we can learn from the Psalms. You could do the Psalms for the rest of your life if you wanted. And in today's psalm that we're going to be looking at, uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about prayer. And I know, like, right off the rip, it could seem like, wow, you know, it's, it's a church doing a message about prayer, like, duh. But, but look, I, I'm the student director at, at my church, so I, I refuse to just, like, talk at you in a boring and monotone way for, like, 30 minutes, so trust me, we're going to get somewhere with this. Uh, my ask here this morning is if you don't believe in God or if you, you don't pray, my ask would be that you just lean in and hear a little bit more about what this, this powerful yet common practice could look like in your life. And if, if you do pray, whether or not you believe in God, my ask would still be that you, you lean in to what we have for you today so that maybe you can get a different perspective on prayer itself. See, today I want to help us solve a problem. The problem is we don't really know where to go in hard times, and I believe prayer is the answer to that, especially when you're mad at God or upset with your circumstances. And I would assume that when it comes to prayer, there are all different kinds of feelings and perceptions and thoughts that we have that surround it. You know, even as I just say the word prayer, all different thoughts are racing through our minds. Some of us are thinking of what our prayer life used to be compared to what it is now, Some of us are thinking like, oh no, we're talking about like the weird supernatural stuff in church this week. I shouldn't have accepted the invite. Some of us are honest, we're there. Some of us are thinking about the prayers in our life that are still unanswered. We'll talk a little bit about that. Some of us are thrown back to the very first time that we were ever asked to pray out loud. Anyone remember that like small group or youth group experience? Does anyone remember that? See, I I remember mine, you know, where you said like, yeah, I, I pray all the time. And then they ask you to pray for the group and you're like, oh boy bluff called, like I'm in trouble, and your knees get weak, and your palms get sweaty, and you start worried that you're going to like pray about mom's spaghetti, and it just gets weird. It's just weird. The year was 2011, and 12-year-old Jack had just been like youth group peer pressured into his first ever out loud prayer, but here's the problem. This was also my first ever prayer in general, not just out loud, because they picked the atheist kid in the corner, me, to be the first kid to ever to pray out loud for the group. And they encouraged me that it's not that hard, that I can do it. All you gotta do is just speak freely. And all I could think was, you know, I'm not worried that it's gonna be hard. I'm worried about the idea of like speaking freely and not accidentally saying a curse word in front of everybody. So I say, okay, like they insisted. So I bowed my head and I kind of like looked around and I could see a couple other people that also had their eyes open. And I was kind of thinking like, is this like the non-Christian club that we've got going on right here? Anyone with their eyes open? I thought maybe that's what that was. And then, like, I see the kid, like, looking at me that's, like, definitely Christian looking at me. I'm like, oh, boy, then we got to start. And so I close my eyes, and I'm like, all right, dear God. And no one seems weirded out by that, so I'm like, all right, check one. We're there. And I just start saying stuff. I'm like, thanks for this day and for the weather. It was, like, raining that day. I still was like, whatever. But then no one seemed like it was weird, so I got a little cocky, and I was like, and bless us. I didn't even know what bless meant, but it just felt right. And I was like, I don't think I've talked long enough, so I just kind of waited a second, and I was like, and can you just fix things, I guess? And then I kind of like nudged my friend, and I was like, yeah, what do you do? You just say like, amen, and you're done? He's like, yeah, pretty much. And I was like, amen, and then it was done, and that was it. And I know, it's super weird, but but let's be real. If your prayers sound like this, that's that's great, because at least you're entering the arena of talking to our creator. At least you're trying to step into this at times weird or, or confusing, difficult experience because it deepens your relationship with someone who knows you and loves you deeply. And I would assume deep down, no matter who you are or what you believe, we could all use a little bit more of that kind of relationship because life is hard. It knocks us down more oftentimes than it lifts us up. And you know that just as good as I do. Life is hard. It's filled with pain from the low hum of anxiety that you may feel daily to the crashing hardship that seems to happen at least once a year. But with all this pain and suffering, it's hard to know where to turn. But what is nice to know at times is that we're not the only ones. The psalm that I want to be looking at specifically this morning is Psalm 77. It's one of the few psalms actually not written by David. It's it's written by this guy named Asaph. 
And I think he gets this struggle a lot like we do. So if we look at this first part of the Psalm in Psalm 77, verses one through three, it says, I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me. When I was deep in trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long, I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. So with the little that we know about Asaph, what we do know is that honestly, like our boy's going through it right now. Like he's really trying to thug it out, but it's not going well. But really, this life that we talked about that can beat us down, it's done exactly that to him. He's in deep trouble. He's looking for help. He needs comfort. He's so angry at God that he moans every time he just thinks about him. Maybe some of us have been there. You know, our friends or our families or people we trust, they hurt us or they change, and now life feels unstable. Or maybe people get sick and die, and it reminds of how fragile life is. We get mad at God for not doing what we wanted. Even when things are going, like, generally well, we can still feel kind of like meh and discontent. There's even studies that show that only one-third of young adults actually believe they have someone who deeply cares about them. This world is broken, and a lot of the time, a lot of the time, the last thing that we want to do is go to God about it. But what did Asaph do? This guy who wrote this song that we looked at, if we look a little further, just to the next verse, it says, you don't let me sleep, I'm too distressed to even pray. It turns from talking about God to talking to him. Sure, he's angry at God, but he's, he's talking to him. It's, it's a little weird, because in this first part of the prayer, he says, I'm too distressed to even pray, and if I'm God, I'm like, well, I got you, because look, you're talking to me right now, we're figuring it out. But Asaph is in the face of trouble, deep sorrow. And what does he do? He talks to God. And really honestly, I might add, this is not one of those clean, rehearsed, God, we love you so much prayers. Listen to how real and how raw this prayer is. We go again in verse five. It says, I think of the good old days long since ended. When my nights were filled with joyful songs, I searched my soul and pondered the difference now. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he ever be kind to me again? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he slammed the door on his compassion? And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. Asaph is admitting to feeling rejected, feeling mistreated, feeling unloved, feeling like promises have been broken, that there's not been grace towards him, that he's been shut out and turned away. And I would be willing to bet that at least to some degree, there are people in here who get that feeling. And yet we can't forget to look at, look at this with a wider lens, like what's happening here? He is praying these things to the same God that he is angry and upset and disappointed with. But even though we may have the same questions and emotions towards God, we don't often pray like this. For a lot of us, a prayer is like a box to check or it's an activity to hold at arm's length, a band-aid to slap on a broken situation, something that we just don't do, or maybe at worst case scenario, it's a last ditch effort at hope. Whatever it is for you, I wanna help take us from that to an actual powerful yet common practice of relating to our creator in a deep and intimate way that actually allows us to have a better picture of who he is and what that means for our lives. I wanna let you in on what I believe is the secret sauce to prayer. What I wanna spend the rest of our time talking about this morning is rejoicing in prayer, rejoicing in prayer. And I know when I say that, you may be thinking like, uh, did you even read that psalm that we just read? Like that sounded like anything but rejoicing. And we'll come back to that in a second. But maybe you're thinking, well, my life right now feels like Asaph's. What if my prayers keep going unanswered? You know, I'll admit rejoicing in prayer is a lot easier said than done because there's a problem when it comes to being able to rejoice in prayer. The problem that a lot of us are facing is not that we just don't rejoice in prayer because then that would be easy. The answer would be like, all right, just do it. Problem solved, sermon over. No, the problem is we live in a fallen world, one where hope is fleeting, where prayers go unanswered, where we question ourselves, we question God, and where a world where hardship is expected and joy feels like this thing to have a death grip on before it leaves. It's the same world where Asaph says that prayer in Psalm 77. And I'm not here to help us figure out how to rejoice in prayer when things are going really well, that's easy. What we're talking about is why we rejoice in prayer and how we do it, especially in the midst of struggle or unanswered prayer. That being said, I wanna be very clear. This is not a shut up and just force yourself to be happy talk. 
Like take all of those real hard feelings and shove them down, eat them, never let them out. That's not what this is. Nowhere in here will you hear me say, stuff down your feelings, don't talk to God about your real pain in your life. Because honestly, that's the opposite of what you should do. Not every prayer, not every minute of our lives is happy, joyful, singing to him. I'm not saying to wake up in the morning, take a deep breath in and just, I am so thankful for another beautiful day in the glorious presence of my savior. And if you already do that, honestly, we hate you, all right? Like, we, good for you. Because the reality is, for most of us, life is hard. But what, what has been fascinating is even with this heartache and this confusion on what to do in life, where to run to, it, it's crazy that an overwhelming number of people are praying. I was going through some of the stats of this uh, just past week. It's 55% of adults pray every day. 71% of adults pray once a week. And 41% of Gen Z and millennials pray every day. And all of these numbers are continuing to go up since 2020, which was obviously a difficult year. And so with all of this happening, we have to be talking about the reality of who it is that we're actually praying to and some of the mechanics and movements of prayer. And one of them that we land on today is this idea of rejoicing, because often it's something that we don't do, but scripture teaches us that it's important. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is two words, pray continually. The verse before that is two different words, 5.16. It says rejoice always. In other words, prayer helps you rejoice. Rejoicing helps you pray. If you remember those four words, and you've remembered like two whole verses in Scripture, so congratulations. Mary says in Luke 147, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Paul talks in Philippians at length about rejoicing in the Lord, even as he's writing that letter while sitting in a jail cell. And if that's not enough, basically, half of the book of Psalms that you guys have been going through this summer is about this. It's rejoicing, calling out in worship because of who God is. One of the themes throughout the whole narratives of Scripture is to rejoice in God the Father simply because of who he is. And yet for a lot of us, myself included, we don't really do that. And here's some reasons that I think we avoid rejoicing in prayer. One is we don't pray. I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna be hard to rejoice in prayer if you never take the time to pray. That's what you learned in church today. But really, maybe you aren't someone that falls into these stats of people who are praying. You could be missing out on not only the closeness and the intimacy of prayer, but also the perspective that rejoicing in him and his presence brings to your life and your situations. Another reason I think we avoid rejoicing in prayer is because life is hard. We've already talked about this. Maybe your prayers look like what we read in the first verses in Psalm 77. I mean, let's be real. I don't have to stand up here and convince you that life is hard. You know it is. Jesus himself himself promises that we are going to go through it. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. What can happen is we could start to create this, like the narrative in our mind that what's happening to us Maybe we, maybe we blame God for it, or we think he's doing it to us, or maybe we're distracted by the formidable parts in our lives, too distracted by the formidable parts in our life to actually take time to lift him up and be thankful for who he is and just what he does. The dark world that we're accustomed to has pulled us away, and it hides us from the beautiful, bright nature of who God is and the joy and the presence that he creates in us. That leads us to the last reason that we don't rejoice in prayer. It's because we don't know or we forget who God is. If we don't know God or if we knew him but continue to forget his nature, it can be easy to fall out of the habit of prayer, especially with joy. Let's think about it. The opposite of this is true as well. The more we know him and remember his kindness, the more we will naturally want to rejoice in his presence. And that's not me just trying to make this make sense, just saying like, hey, try and rejoice this random guy up here. Jesus actually demonstrates this for us himself. In the famous Lord's Prayer, it starts with Jesus' disciples asking him how to pray. Not because they don't know how, but simply because they can see this awesome relationship that Jesus has with his Father. And he showed them something that was all new to them. It wasn't, hey, you guys need to pray longer or pray harder or pray with more faith, just, just differently. And he responds at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Just in the small beginning parts of this prayer, he already teaches us so much. And one of the things that he's teaching us is to rejoice in prayer. And I know when we look at that, we don't automatically associate that with rejoicing. Let's take a closer look at what hallowed 
uh, means in scripture. Because for us, we either think it's just some super weird term or it reminds us of like Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, anybody? Every time I hear it, that's what I think. Sorry to ruin it for you too. But in other translations, it's clear what he's really saying here is holy be your name. It's saying to God, you are set apart, you are greater, your name is different, you are awesome, big, wonderful, good. This sense of reverence and, and appreciation is immediately established with him. He starts with rejoicing in who God is, recognizes his goodness, his power, his grandeur. It takes the focus off of ourselves for once in our lives and rightfully puts it on God. Because at its core, prayer really isn't about us. It has benefits for us, like getting to connect with God, but it's about him. So maybe that's a question for you to ask yourself this morning. When you pray, is your focus on you or is it on God? When you pray, is your focus on how holy, how divine, how, how great God is? Or is it on the possible results that your prayer could produce in your life? Jesus models for us this immediate recentering and rejoicing in who God is and in him, we see this deepness and this intimacy between God and Jesus. And I think for us, we see that and we think like, I want that level of connection with him. I want that kind of closeness. I want that kind of trust. I want my prayers to produce that in my life. And for a lot of us, what's happening is we want the results and the power of praying like Jesus while we pray the same way the devil would. Now, for some of you, you just heard me say you are the devil. That is not what I said. Let me explain here. When Jesus prays, he starts by elevating the name of God, rejoicing in who he is. He is unlike anything, anyone else. And it got me looking at what else God was called in the Bible, and it brought me to a passage in Genesis that a lot of us are probably familiar, of, familiar with. Back in Genesis 2, God is always referred to as Yahweh Elohim. Those are the words for God, Yahweh Elohim. We see the name of God, uh, that is this Hebrew word translated from Yahweh Elohim. It means Lord God. It's another way of elevating his name. He is the Lord God. He is big. He is good. He's worthy of following. God creates the heavens and the earth, Adam and Eve in the first chapter of Genesis. And then this is what he tells Adam in Genesis 2. It says, and the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, that word for God there, Yahweh Elohim, big, powerful, worthy of following, he commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of, good, of the knowledge of good and evil. He does all this good, but he gives them this one rule, don't eat from the tree. Other than that, that's pretty much it. You're naked, have fun with that. That's cool, figure that out. But then something subtle but, but interesting happens when the serpent comes along in the story. The, the serpent, who is the devil, flips the narrative from look at all this freedom Look at all this freedom and goodness of God to focus on what you want, what you want to do. And he says to Eve in, in Genesis 3, it says, did God, but then he uses a different word. He just drops the Yahweh and uses Elohim. Did God, Elohim, really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I was explaining this passage to my, my sister. I was trying to talk, walk her through this. She's not a Christian. And she, I was talking to her this, and she was like, is this like the first ever gaslighting. And I was like, actually, yeah, that's like a perfect way to explain what's going on here. Um, but there's something going on here when the serpent refers to God as just Elohim, really just God. This abstract, immaterial, not knowable name for divinity. It excludes all of the relational equity that we have with God and kind of makes him more like whoever that guy is up in the sky. It would be like calling your friend Mike, who's a doctor, just calling him doctor, or calling your dad just sir. Like, it's technically true, but it nulls and forgets any real relationship. An author that speaks a ton on prayer, Tyler Staten, says, it's respectful, but distant, depersonalized. The more intimacy in a relationship, the less likely it, someone is to be known by a title. The serpent subtly demotes God from father to a, stint, to a distant, stingy dictator. Mighty in power, sure, but unknowable and untrustable. And I just can't help but wonder... Is this how we often go to God in our prayers? Lacking the, the deep, intimate connection, almost unconsciously demoting him because we forget to rejoice in just who he is. And we just get caught up in our circumstances. How often do we just pray, dear God, do this and do that, or thank you for this and thank you for that, and the whole time we hold him at arm's length away because we are too scared or too worried to be in a relationship with the all-powerful God? Maybe it's because we're mad at him. Maybe it's because we're worried that we may never get an answer to the prayer that we want. We know that's what Asa felt in Psalm 77. 
And what's interesting is if we go back and that go back to that passage and look at what we said, look at what he says deeper. It says, I think of the I think of the good old days long since ended, when my nights are filled with joyful songs. I search my soul and ponder the difference now. And we had these questions. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Is he ever gonna be kind to me again? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? And then we see again, verse nine, has God, and he uses that word, Elohim, the one the serpent used, forgotten to be gracious? Has, has this God, this guy up in the sky, forgotten to be gracious? And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. He uses that same word, Elohim. Has God, distant, forgotten, distant being forgotten to show me grace? Has he rejected me? Does he even love me? And he asked these questions of God. But he doesn't take a second to remember who he is and just rejoice until we see this next line. Verse 11, it says, but then I recall all you have done, O Lord. And that word comes back Yahweh, a reminder of who he really is. He remembers who he is, and he is deciding to rejoice in who he knows God to be. He takes a moment to reflect and rejoice in all that God has done. And when he does this, look at the switch that it makes in his heart and in his prayer. It says, then I recall all that you've done, O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. O God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm, you redeemed your people. There is something to this idea of rejoicing in prayer. Does this mean that we always have to start with adoration and even if we don't feel it, just fake it? No, there are days where that's not where we're at and God doesn't condemn us for that. We refuse to listen. Again, that guy Tyler Staten said, if you can't pray with, enough, with hope or faith, God isn't bothered. He wants you to tell him about your doubt and your disappointment. If you can't pray in phrases of praise and adoration, don't fake it. Pray your complaints, your anger, or your confusion. If you're more comfortable with cynicism and then cynicism than innocence, unsure about your motives, afraid of silence, afraid of an answer, or pretty confident that you aren't doing it right, you're in the perfect starting place. It's exactly what we saw in the beginning of Psalm 77, and yet we see Asaph still eventually come to a point of rejoicing, and it completely reframes his posture. And so naturally, the question now is, well, how do we do that? How do we get there? So I'm gonna give you three things that you can start doing to get into a better habit of having the right picture of who God is and out of that rejoicing in our prayers to him. The first thing we have to do is we have to recall. This is what we see Asaph do in Psalm 77. When we recall the ways that he has shown up for us in the past, it calls us to rejoice, just like it did in Psalm 77. It can be in situations that he's brought us out of. It could be growth in our life. The fact that we're just alive and breathing today, that we have the grace to have woken up that day the grace that he shows us time and time again, the prayers that he's answered in the past maybe. So a lot of us may sit in this destructive cycle where we, we forget what we has done, what he's done, and so it makes us less likely to go to him. And we don't spend consistent time with God and it makes it easier to not attribute all the things that he's doing in our lives to him. And so when we forget what he's done, it makes us less likely to go to him. And when we're less likely to go to him, we just continue to forget what he's done. So what if we started... Uh, this practice of rejoicing in our prayer? What if we like snapped that cycle and made our own redemptive cycle? One in where we force ourselves to start by remembering him, reflecting on him. And when we do this, it helps us to center ourselves on his character because we are reminded of all that he's done, all that he's doing. And out of that place of remembrance and adoration of his character, it allows us to rejoice in his presence because we're reminded how good he is. And that will only serve us to make us want to go to him more. As we recall the incredible things that he's done for us, it changes our mindset. It changes our mindset to be in a place of thankfulness in our prayers. A simple way that we can do this is by using the P-R-A-Y method, where you pause, take a moment to get ready for prayer, center yourselves, and then you are, rejoice and recall. Think back, do this, this practice that we've been talking about. Do what, he, what Asaph does in Psalm 77. Recall all the things that he's done for you. Center yourselves on who he is. Before we get into the A, the ask, part of prayer that we're most comfortable with, most uh, familiar with, is to ask. And then yield, take some time to give over what needs to be given over to Christ. This is a tool that I use in my own life to remind me to rejoice in him even before I get into the, my own asks that I have for him. 
Now, of course, as we talk about recalling what Jesus has done for us in the past, we're also confronted with the ways that we felt hurt or felt shortchanged by him, or how do we reflect with joy when we're reminded of the unanswered prayer in our lives? How do we continue to run to him when we're reminded of all the times where we have in the past and it seemed like nothing really happened? When the loved one is still sick or when the perfect job never came along or your parents are still fighting or you have the money for a ring but no one to give it to. Again, if we look at Jesus as our example, he says to be persistent. Do not stop praying. Keep asking. And this isn't just some dude who had it perfect telling us not to give up. Jesus himself had multiple prayers that went unanswered. We see that in scripture. On the night of his arrest, Matthew says, he went on a little further and bowed his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus is praying, God, please don't make me have to go through this. Do it another way. I don't want this to happen. And yet this unanswered prayer of his has no bearing on who God is to him, his ability to rejoice in who he is. It's possible to rejoice in, a, rejoice in God while in the midst of your unanswered prayer. And it's not lost on me that as we pray, we're confronted with some of the, the deepest emotional baggage that we have. The prayers in our life that we face um, in, in the face of persistence that still seem to stand unanswered. I'm not saying it's easy to just rejoice. There's real deep pain there. As I reflect on my own life and my prayers, I'm faced with the uncomfortable reality that the two things that I pray for the most in my life, my family's salvation and the addiction that has all but taken my mom, they still go unanswered today. And when I typically hear people speak on unanswered prayer, all of my emotion comes bubbling up to the surface and I just wanna like scream, like don't tell me I'm not praying hard enough. Don't tell me I need more faith. Then I have to remember That's not what this is. That's not what's happening. No one prayed harder, no one prayed with more faith than Jesus, and yet his prayers at times still went unanswered or he was told no. And yet, he still trusted in the one he was praying to as the one who is over all things. He lifts him up as good. He lifts him up as good and worthy of following, even in the midst of struggle. But I know what it's like to feel like God has left me on red. It doesn't just get easier. It is discouraging, but I don't want us to struggle to connect with our awesome creator because of it. He is too good to miss out on. Because when I look at Jesus and his connection and trust in who his father is, it spurs me on to not give up. Success in this is not to have all of your prayers answered. It's not to always be happy and run at life with a foolish optimism, but it is to have trust in who he is, who God is, and who he is for us. Remember, it's not about us, it's about him. What if recognizing who he is is more important than receiving what we're asking for in our prayers? That leads us to our next application. We have to recognize. We recall, and then we recognize. We we recognize both who he is and who he is to us, and it calls us to rejoice. We can rejoice in our incredible presence with our incredible God. Let's take a closer look at what Asaph is doing in our psalm this morning. Again, in verse 11, it says, I recall all that you've done. It says, I remember your wonderful deeds long ago, they are constantly in my thoughts. I can't stop thinking about your mighty works. Your ways are holy. You demonstrate your awesome power. You, are, you redeemed your people. He recalls and remembers some attributes of God. He calls it out in his prayer and it leads him to be able to rejoice in him because he recognizes who God is. He calls out these attributes. Imagine if we recognize both his power and his holiness as well as his goodness and closeness as our heavenly father. How much more would we want to be in his presence and be glad in it, no matter the outside influences in our life? So in a way, as we talk about rejoicing in prayer, the answer is to look at God for who he really is and out of that sense of goodness and find contentment and joy in his grace to us. Try to keep those outside forces from getting in the way of your ability to recognize who he is, which leads us to our last application for today. So we must relinquish. We recall who he's been, we recognize who he is, and we relinquish, we surrender, we let go of our life, hand over our life to him. Because the truth is, if we don't trust God enough to give him control, how could we ever rejoice in the fact that he actually does have control over all things? This is especially true in the midst of our pain. It's harder to relinquish control of our life when all we want to do is grab it tight and fix all the things we can ourselves. For me, this makes me think of the struggle that I've had with my mom all these years. I have prayed countless times about it. 
And most of those don't include rejoicing, if I'm honest, because of my anger at God for it. And for, all of, for a lot of my life, I've just tried to deal with it or, or fix the things that I could around me or ignore it, try not to let it affect me. But, but freedom from the hopelessness, not, for, not freedom from the frustration or, or emotion, but freedom from the despair and the hopelessness comes when I truly relinquish, give over that struggle to God. I have to remind myself to rejoice in him, rejoice in him, otherwise I'll never want to, to give it over, to relinquish. And it's not natural for me or probably anyone to do this, but I know if anyone is capable of turning hopelessness on its head, it's God. And that's what I thought in that first ever prayer that we talked about. It was seventh grade, and I'd caught my mom lying to me, and I was, I was angry, and I was hurt. I felt like this is the hundredth time it's happened. I just felt defeated. I was confused. I felt vulnerable, and I was terrified of what was going to happen in the future. And a couple days later that week, I was in our youth group, and I was asked to pray out loud. And that's why I ended the prayer the way that I did. Just fix things, I guess. Because in that moment, I looked around and all I knew was my life is broken. And my sorry attempts at fixing it are failing. So God, if you care, or if you're even real, please fix it. And to this day, we're not really there yet. And there are plenty of times where I struggle to have the right mindset when I go to him. There are plenty of prayers that sound like the beginning of Psalm 77, that he's just left me. But there is peace and joy that comes with knowing that the one who is over all things, the God of the impossible, the one who sent his son to die on the cross for me, he's taking care of it, even if it's not the way that I would want him to. Because when I recognize and recall his goodness and grace for me, how could I not rejoice? Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that even in the midst of pain or whatever's going on in our lives, we can rejoice in your presence. God, help us remind ourselves of that. Help us be people who run to you rather than away from you because of your goodness. God, we love you and we're thankful for the things that you've done in our lives, the little things, the big things, even for the things that we're not aware of yet, Lord. I'm thankful for all of them. It's in your name we pray. Amen.